And next, we have the introduction of Terry. Uh, Terry Simpkins, um, or Teresa Simpkins, let me say, Dr. Teresa Simpkins. And if I can even add all of those letters after her name, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a mouthful, more than supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Uh, um, so we have Terry with us, a doctor. She's a forward thinking, uh, industry focused academic, a consultant, public speaker, and author. Uh, she has a book out called Braver, Stronger, Smarter. It's all around uh, how to get rid of the imposter phenomenon, phenomenon. That word always gets me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really interesting book and it aims to get individuals from, individuals and companies uh, from identifying uh, to overcoming this. Uh, today, she's gonna be talking more about leadership uh, and she is also the founder of and CEO of Mischief Business Engineering, uh, based out of the UK and also functioning in Australia. They work with uh, industry associates, governments, large organizations, and SMEs uh, around the globe. <clears throat> so she has a great understanding around leadership and how not only around leadership conceptually, but how to take leadership concepts and turn them into practice. Uh, so please do have your pen and paper ready uh, for notes, because now I'm about to hand you over to Teresa. Thank you. Teresa, um, when you're ready, please do uh, share your screen. Sure. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Just uh, while we're getting the um, the slide deck up. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you. Um, the, the topics that we'll, we'll talk through today are very close to my heart in that I've been looking at uh, emerging leadership and managerial paradigms for some years now. And it has struck me over the last three or four months how the uh, emerging thought around leadership in particular has been advanced over the last few months, uh, particularly as we look to, to leadership to um, to really help soften the blow of what, what is, um, you know, to use an overused term, a quite an unprecedented suite of uh, experiences that we're all uh, uh, you know, working through at the moment. So this presentation is not necessarily about the detail or the, the specifics, rather an expansive view of how leaders must respond in the light of the current pandemic. It is based on some work done by McKinsey, uh, a framework called Five R's. Uh, and it talks about how organizations and leaders in particular should be looking at, at moving out of uh, the pandemic while still uh, you know, dealing with issues that are absolutely resonant in the current moment. It's also based on a number of, of articles that I've written uh, since that work came out, appeared in the uh, Association of Business MBA's uh, association magazine called Ambition and a number of HR publications as well. Normally, if I would be doing this as a face-to-face -face session, it would be quite conversational, but I do encourage you to add in your questions, which as Daniel suggested, are gonna go directly to him. We um, may well uh, deal with some comments as we go along. If indeed we get a number of questions that are about one of these particular issues that we bring up, uh, Daniel will uh, interrupt and we'll, um, we'll deal with those uh, as we go along. But we will allow some time at the end. Um, under normal circumstances, I've done similar uh, conversational sessions like this and there's quite a lot of questions and a lot of discussion to be had at the end so I've left quite a, a good deal of, of opportunity for people to uh, perhaps make some contributions ask some questions uh, perhaps argue and challenge some of the things that we, we will be talking about today so thought to be an ancient curse may you live in interesting times has some real resonance today. In the past few months, the unthinkable has become reality. Resilience has become a currency and reliance on digital infrastructure, such as the internet, has become much less a luxury than an indispensable utility. The great Sir Terry Pratchett summed it up well when he suggested that Chaos is found in greatest abundance wherever order is being sought. 
it always defeats order because it's better organized. I think what he meant by that is that chaos will roll on because it has no predefined boundaries, it has no bureaucracy, and it certainly doesn't have any rules of engagement. The quote is also timely as our modern systems, our organisational processes, our governance structures and, and human behaviours follow a set of generally accepted rules by they or inform. But in times of crisis, all that is challenged. And even though things are moving on now, as we come out of lockdown, as we start to look post pandemic rather than looking after the current crisis, as it, as it appeared some months ago. Our systems and our practices continue to be disruptive and are often left wanting. We see this with ongoing issues with government structures designed to manage our way out of the pandemic and of course the consequences that the pandemic has thrown up and what the responses um, have, have also led to. So last year, I stood in front of a group of leaders, CEOs, CFOs, human resources developments, people involved in organisational development. And we were talking about the march of Industry 4.0, the second machine age, and the enormity of the profound changes predicted through implementation of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, automation, associated technologies. And of course, we were discussing hollowing out of the workforce, global mass displacement of workers, uh, workforce mobility. And when we couple that together with social shifts such as aging populations, the changing nature of work, how we come to fit work into our lives, arguments and discussions and challenges around diversity, widening disparities in privilege and new business models, once we put all of that together in a, in a mess of moving parts, we ended up with questions from the floor about how leaders in global economies could actually meet the challenge of pulling this all together. And rather flippantly, I suggested that short of a catastrophic social and economic event of global proportions, I wasn't quite sure how we could move in the short term to manage the fallout from all of those changes put together. I didn't actually expect that we would have a catastrophic social event of global proportions, but well, here we are. And while the pre-COVID-19 business landscape was identified as volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, right now it's VUCA, leaders have been challenged by the crisis responses. Whilst responding to urgent, unpredictable and possibly transformative business circumstances. Leaders and those charged with organisational development are simultaneously challenged with envisaging how economic and organisation, organisational landscapes are going to look in the near, the mid and the long terms. But rather than catalyzing the different ways of working, the pandemic has in many ways just hastened what we had already seen on the cards as the march of industry 4.0, second machine age, however you want to term it, actually gained pace. So this seminar is based on an, that elegant model devised by McKinsey. And whilst it was published a few months ago now and we've moved on, the identified five stages of navigating towards a post-pandemic organisation on operation are still resonant. And considering each of these in turn, we'll look at the application of emerging capability and reconceive managerial paradigms for a post-pandemic epoch. And as I suggested, please um, uh, put your questions in uh, the chat box to Daniel and we'll, uh, we'll either deal with those as we go along or as I said, we'll manage those at, at the end, either or. So let's have a look at the first R uh, then. Resolve. Knowing what to do is not enough. Particularly in the early stages of the pandemic, we had traditional notions of operations that were arguably rendered irrelevant. The landscape had changed so quickly and so enormously that tackling the scale and scope 
of the ongoing crisis required not only the capacity to respond to immediate priorities, things like utilising online technologies, redeploying resources, scaling back workforces, for example, but we needed to avoid the dithering that came from deep uncertainty. And also about understanding what capabilities were underdeveloped now that we exist in a different landscape. Of course, learning and development and organisational development have key roles to play and continue to play those roles now. Fundamentally, how did those charged with making decisions in the absence of surety, the absence of data, the absence of precedent, how do we generate confidence in choices and garner the confidence of others in such a time? And indeed, some of you put into, into the poll at the beginning that how do you lead people through change? Well, some of this will perhaps throw up some, some food for thought on that question. So how do leaders make the call between being right and being swift to make decisions in pressing circumstances? Of course, it's going to be contextual for different organisations, but making decisions always needs to be tempered with an element of risk mitigation. But also, as leaders, we need to understand that people are not rational actors. They will often be misguided by poor sense making around the data that they have, or the data that they can't make sense of. They're dealing with rumour and they're dealing with the optics. And we're seeing this quite a lot now with inquiries about how the pandemic was handled mishandled uh, by governments and uh, those in senior leadership in organisations, for example. So let's have a look at the practicalities of this. Um, unkindly, but in some cases perhaps accurately, values, mission and vision statements were once viewed with a bit of scepticism. They were considered to be a suite of statements generated largely by consultants to hang on the wall of executive officers. And I, I understand this because as a consultant, I was engaged to actually do that for some organisations. But these platform statements now take on a new importance. While vision and mission may be challenged by a new context, organisational values can provide an anchor for the decision making in times when all else is unfamiliar or unprecedented. They become the the centre around, around which leaders and others in the organisation will make those sorts of decisions, given that they're perhaps having uh, this, this dual conflict of being right and being quick. Authentic organisational values identify platform principles for behaviour, character and culture. And in times of relative calm, we rely on them, but even more so in times of disruption and crisis. As once steadfast beliefs around what's acceptable and what's not are challenged, our organisational values can be the touchstone to organisational decision making, obviously can guide leadership behaviour and can drive how communities and stakeholder engagement is enacted during times of calamity and challenge. Values, missions and visions anchor our action to garner unity. As things change rapidly, everyone can stay on the same page about how decisions are being made. Provide some surety that even though things are rocky, things are uncertain, things are complex, uh, yeah, the, the people who are making decisions are going to come back to those core anchors. And of course we saw this in the beginning of the, of the pandemic when we had people asking us to stay on message and we saw it time and time again save the NHS, save lives. It was a really good example of how it garnered unity, it drew communities together and it, it clearly articulated what it was that the, the government wanted us to do. It provided us with a bigger picture that was designed to coalesce our thinking, but more so our actions and our motivations. We of course saw the flip side of that with the subsequent messaging, we stay alert, don't go out, stay at home, not quite sure what we're doing here. It had quite the opposite effect of that first, that, that, that first values-based uh, statement which tried to garner that unity. It provided us with a steadfast call which the subsequent stay alert messaging perhaps didn't. So the, the second R then is resilience. 
And of course, resilience is a reflection of leadership. While the word resilience has been liberally bandied about lately, it simply suggests the capacity to recover quickly after setbacks or disturbances. And it applies, of course, equally to individuals as to organisations. When quite crisis responses may incur profound cost to people, to communities, and this might include temporary layoffs, redeployment or loss of employment, for example, those making decisions must act with humility and human compassion. Where commonality of understanding around rules and uh, the bureaucracy of business, for example, and where surety of context is challenged or displaced, resilience relies on people. It doesn't rely on systems and bureaucracies. It is the people that are actually going to bring this resilience to organisations. It is their capacity to shift, to bend, and to make sense of a world upended that makes resilience a human function rather than a function of systems and process. While systems and process can provide guidance, if our context shifts and those bureaucracies are then broken, it is people that we rely on to provide us with that organisational and personal resilience. People will do this for leaders that they trust to make hard decisions with empathy and care. Leadership itself, of course, is being questioned. For example, we've seen the poster child of a, of a, of a new leadership paradigm, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, has been identified as one such leader for her authenticity but also her decisiveness and focus on unity in times of emergency, not only in relation to the pandemic, but also in terms of, of natural disasters and uh, terrorism and um, you know, tragedies as such as those. And indeed, she's come out of this with the highest approval rating for any New Zealand government in history. Where emotion was once managed out of the leadership narrative, we're we're beginning to see that people who are openly engaged with the humanness of employees, of customers, other stakeholders and communities, this is now an indication of being in touch with a much bigger picture. And of course, we've had discussions around, is this a gender-based construct? Is it something else? We might talk about it at the, at, at the end, but certainly um, leadership now is being framed up as a, as a human function rather than one of gender. It is not necessarily about you know, whether you're male or female or, or other. And what we're seeing here is charisma being replaced with competence. And in my opinion, not before time. So let's have a look at the practicalities around this then. Um, Indeed, this rests on organisational development um, and, of course, human sense making is based on trust. And this is, as I mentioned before, drives resilience in organisations. And those organisations that have cultivated cultures of trust and subscribe to a leadership paradigm that inspires shared values and promotes stewardship over personal gain are more likely to see their people rise to meet the demands made of them. It is likely that those businesses that have infused their past leadership behaviours with collaboration, with fairness, with integrity, are more likely to see greater resilience of the workforce. And this, of course, is both during and after the crisis. Those that have not will struggle to have their people step up and provide that level of, of resilience. And now that the dust has settled, there are emerging questions around the technical and leadership capacities of those in charge, such as the government, for example. Daniel, we've hey. got some questions. Hey, Tony, we do have some questions coming through. We have one Excellent. that's relevant to this actual slide. We have some other questions cool. for the end, but we have one that's uh, relevant for this slide. Uh, what do you mean by sense-making? Sense-making. A, that's a really good question. The, the basic underpinning understanding that we as humans have of the world is it comes from our quick decisions it's 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 where we um, draw on past learning so we 
we have a look at a, uh, a situation or a process or even a person or a set of behaviours and we make a call on whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether it's appropriate, whether it's inappropriate, whether it's going to work or whether it's not, dependent on our past learning. So, for example, sense making is associated with bias. So, if we were to, uh, you know, say in the recruitment and selection process, for example, uh, we talk a lot about bias and, and implicit bias. The, the decisions that we make on, on the spur of a moment based on what we know about the world and, and coming from our past experiences. So in recruitment and selection, we're actually making sense of what this individual might bring to the organisation, how their skills might be uh, utilised and, 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 and what value they might bring. And we're basing that largely on what we know about what that individual has told us, where that individual comes from, how they've their education has made a contribution and we're making these judgments based on what this person is telling us and all of the other stuff that comes uh, with it and, and as i said that's often the root of bias so our sense making is a fundamental human reaction and it often stems well you know, in re evolutionary terms it comes from is this thing i've met in the forest going to eat me or am I going to eat it? Do I have to run away or do I have to stand and fight this thing? Or can I knock it on the head and have it for dinner? So that's where the evolutionary immediate judgment calls come from. And the sense making part is the, the culmination of all of that based on our experiences, our learning, and perhaps you know, what is happening actually in that moment. It's the shortcuts, the shortcuts that we take between what's happening now and what have I experienced in the past? And in situations like this, where we have no data, we have no precedence, we've never been in a situation in you know, current living history where a government has shut down an entire economy, not only in our country, but across uh, uh, you know, geographical borders. We've never seen this before. So our sense making becomes challenge. We go, well, I actually haven't done this before. I've never seen this type of, of experience in the past. I, I, I can't make sense of the data because I've got nothing to compare it to. But that's where the sense making comes in. And when you're asking people to make decisions, um, either as leaders or perhaps in, in organisations where their, their bureaucracies are no longer serving them because the context has shifted so markedly, you're relying on people to come back to how their leaders have, have uh, reacted in the past, what sort of judgment calls those leaders are actually making at this point in time. And as I mentioned, that's best served by linking it back to things that don't shift, and that is vision and mission and perhaps, uh, well, certainly values. Uh, mission might shift um, into terms of what it actually is you're doing in your organisation you know, in terms of your output. So whether you're you know, moving from uh, distilling uh, you know, whiskey to making hand sanitizer, or from making high fashion apparel to making scrubs for the NHS, the mission might shift slightly, but the values and and the you know, the, the underpinning uh, vision remains the same. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was one other question. Tom, sure. let, let me know if that makes sense for you. And there's there's one other question from Tom, actually, that's, that followed in uh, while you was just explaining. Um, sure. Is it socially constructed? This is the last one we'll ask, and then we'll ask any more on sense-making at sure. the end. It is absolutely socially constructed. Um, and indeed, you know, the whole premise of sense-making comes from this idea that, that all of our learning is either generated from or is a, uh, applied to or is challenged by the stuff that we're actually learning all the time uh, from from communities from behaviors from from leaders um, from colleagues from family uh, it is absolutely socially constructed yeah Brilliant. thanks thank for your you. question yeah. no worries we'll have more towards the end thank you thanks daniel so moving on to the third r then uh, return. And what we're looking at here is a uh, future focus. And so while leaders are making decisions and enacting priorities to develop appropriate near-term responses to the pandemic, they must also consider what organisational life is going to look like post-pandemic. 
and of course L&D organisational development uh, activities are imperative here. The economic recovery is clearly going to be slow for many. For others, a short-term escalation of demand might be diminished. Think of all those people who are raking in the rewards from increased toilet paper sales and M&S, of course, having a, a massive increase in food sales, but a decline in other areas. Some organisations are not going to survive. And indeed, there's been uh, an estimation that about 25% of retail organisations may not uh, reopen um, for good as we, we move into uh, a removal of the lockdown. And of course, hospitality and tourism, despite government incentives, so remain in jeopardy. But for others, a raft of new opportunities or alternative ways of operating may become apparent. And it's incumbent for all, however, to re-examine extant, emerging and possible future capability development demands. So the practicalities of this, of course, then start us on a deeper and broad reflection that may lead to examination and revisions of things such as supply chains, the nuts and bolts of where we actually get our stuff from and where we're sending it to. We might think more deeply about contractor arrangements. How do we actually uh, engage with people who are either supplying um, stuff, uh, you know, actual you know, uh, materials for our, um, for our business, or indeed people who might be providing services? How are we actually going to finance our organisations going forward? What sort of capability development are we going to need to enact, given that our organisations may have shifted, what we're doing might have shifted, how we're actually structured might have shifted. And that, of course, will have capability demands placed upon it. And of course, product development in line with change. We know from data coming out of a, of a raft of different sources that the ways in which people are engaging with uh, retail, with um, uh, other um, uh, areas of the economy have actually shifted quite markedly. And for some, they're not going to go back to how they used to do their shopping or how they interacted with, with other providers on uh, you know, prior to the, the pandemic. So HR and OD broadly must reflect on talent acquisition and redeployment or development of new capabilities as people move roles, as they leave jobs, as they seek new work. Individuals, of course, will also make decisions about the value of their capabilities to organisations. What are they bringing to their current organisation or perhaps uh, an organisation they're yet to join? Loyalty and psychological contra contracts, the stuff that binds organisations together because people want to stay with them and, and how individuals relate to their leaders and their, um, their supervisors, may well be challenged. For those sectors, and there are many, uh, pre-pandemic may have been experiencing talent shortages. They may well find themselves in a labour landscape that is much changed. We're seeing uh, uh, that, that people who have been made unemployed, for example, or have had quite a marked change in their, in, in their employment may well be uh, now available, whereas prior to they may uh, not have been available to organisations who have well absorbed those, um, those excess um, skills and capabilities. And of course, being an employer of choice during this time, obviously, will be, um, as we gradually return to business, it may never have been so important. And of course, this links back to what we were talking about, values, mission and vision, and how leaders are actually enacting at this time as well. Root and branch revisions of organisations may bring a change to organisational mission, but visions and values are those things that actually remain constant. But those charged with decision-making, of course, must be prepared to scrutinise the fundamentals of yesterday's business to reconceptualise the organisation of today and tomorrow. So some of those questions fundamentally are, do we have a business? Do we have the same business? Or do we have a business that needs to be tweaked? Does it need to be modified? Is it going to be vastly different? And of course, looking forward, if we think about those, those issues that we were dealing with 
before the pandemic, things and questions around automation, around digital technologies, around different ways of working, these things need to be considered as well. And indeed, there's a raft of material coming to the fore now on the better normal. What are we going to take from the old normal that is going to re replenish how we are, how we could actually come to uh, a, the new world of work? And indeed, Siemens and Twitter have already identified that they are implementing you know, work from anywhere policies, and it will be ongoing. There are many other stories that we can share with you in regards to, to those, and I'm sure you've seen them. But organisations that were once thought to be bricks and mortar are now turning digital. So leaders really need to be asking themselves, what more can be done? How can skills and capabilities be leveraged for their best value? How are individuals going to come to their work and generate you know, greater levels of, of, of satisfaction from their work? How are all of these things going to be revised, remodeled, reimagined? And of course, organisational development is going to be key there. So that brings us to the, the fourth R, reimagine. Leveraging the value of diverse voices is probably for me one of the most important R's that we have here and, and elements of the conversation that we're having today. Disproportionate success will be afforded to those organisations who re-envision their value to customers, their consumers, their communities and of course their people. We have much modified expectations we have modified preferences, we have changed behaviours. And of course, this is not only in relation to our consumption of goods and services and how we might interact with organisations, but also how we might reinvent our work lives, our relationships and our interactions with community. We've seen over the last few months, uh, you know, global disruption. We've, we've seen the Black Lives Matter movement come to the fore again. We've, we've seen reprised issues around gender, decolonisation. We've had discussions around how the, uh, the access to the internet has, has highlighted the disparity between those people who are privileged and those who have a, a lack of privilege and are perhaps unable to engage in a revised way of working which has been taken online. These are all really very important questions as we continue to be changed by the responses to the pandemic. As I suggested there, old biases will be turned into millstones. We talked about uh, you know, sense making and how implicit bias um, uh, are linked. And indeed, if organisations continue to uh, allow old biases, moving to a reimagine to optimize and to individuals. So again, uh, looking at the practicalities, what has been a slow burn to date will continue to be accelerated. Navigating through a landscape such as this will demand an inclusive approach. It relies on giving value to the voices that may not have been previously heard. Those who want to work differently, such as parents, those with other caring responsibilities, those who have alternate or additional passions, those who wish to have access to learning and development perhaps have not had the capacity to do so in the past. Organisations are now charged with diminishing the widening disparity between those who have privilege of ongoing learning, access to different ways of working, and those that do not. Those who want access to greater opportunity, but who perhaps may have been locked out due to gender, disability, neurodiversity, their social background, amongst others, and of course, those who bring different or creative, status quo challenging ideas will demand a voice. And indeed, we've seen that over the, over the last couple of months where those voices have been amplified 
on a global scale. If there was ever a time when diversity of thought, action and behaviour, particularly in terms of leadership, was at a premium, it is now. If there was ever a place for effective inclusive practices, not the bolt-on diversity practices that we might have seen as part and parcel of an HR bureaucracy in the past, true inclusion is what we need to see in organisations and particularly in organisations that seek to innovate, to reinvent themselves and to bring better ways of, of working and organising our organisations into a new, or better business as usual. And of course, this is contextual. Uh, we've seen it. We've, we've seen how these sorts of challenges to prevailing thought have actually come to the fore. Who would have thought that we would see you know, our newsreaders broadcasting from their own front rooms? Who would have predicted that we would have Parliament by Zoom? Who would have thought that policing could be done by Microsoft Teams? All of these prevailing biases about how work should be done and that perhaps it couldn't be done in any other ways have really been challenged and are continuing to be questioned. And those organisations that can diminish the excuses of, you know, we need to do it this way because we've always done it this way, it served us well until now, those sorts of excuses will lose power and probably rightly so. So, in regard to the last R, we come to reform. There's been a lot of talk about the new normal, uh, the better normal, uh, the better business as usual. How we consider this must be couched in, well, which bits of the old normal do we want to replicate and bring with us into a, a landscape that is much changed and has the capacity to change still further? While Recognising the tragic human and, and the immense economic costs associated with the pandemic, the schism that has been induced by it will continue to bring about profound restructuring of social constructs and conventions. We've seen it globally, as I said, with, with disruption uh, across geographical borders, um, uh, you know, uh, particularly with the Black Lives Matter and the, the uh, extension of, of those. Um, those calls to action, I suppose, uh, across nations. Leaders might consider the way in which their commercial organisations exist within those communities who are demanding change, and indeed how they interact with institutions such as governments, universities. We've seen a greater level of collaboration between public, private and government entities, and some of that is already paying dividends. We've seen how the crisis adrenaline has delivered projects in days rather than months or years. So if we can do it in these types of environments where we have massive uncertainty, where our workforce may have been dispersed, where we're, we're challenging the status quo of how our organisations are structured and how we, we, we work, then how can we make that continue on? Indeed, McKinsey, suggested just yesterday in a report out, says a report entitled The Quickening actually, suggested that 10 years of e-commerce growth has occurred in the last 90 days. Now one needs to think about, well, what benefits and challenges does this bring? What ongoing and retained challenges will that um, bring going forward? What can we lift from that? take some value from and continue on with? And indeed, all of these are questions for leaders. So which bit of the new normal will pass into a better normal? Leaders and those charged with organisational development in particular, um, and particularly those operating in commercial with interactions with third sector and public institutions are now charged not only with navigating through volatility in the short term, but, but also with reforming the better normal for the mid to longer term too. So the types of things we're, we're seeing coming to the fore here are things that we were talking about prior to, to the pandemic, but have gained an awful lot of traction and the, the importance of them are accelerating. 
things such as the circular economy, so managing out waste for the, so that we're actually seeing a better use of our resources that are going into uh, production rather than recycling at the end of the cycle. Sustainability in all its forms, not just in terms of environmental sustainability, but also workforce uh, sustainability, for example. We know that we continue to have uh, an ageing workforce. We know that that workforce is divided and it will be hollowed out um, by the, the introduction and the, um, the prevalence of artificial intelligence, machine learning, other forms of automation, for example. Revised social con contracts. How are organisations coming to a broader community and how are they actually interacting with the, with the, the people, the entities, the communities that are giving them a, a license to operate? Expansive stakeholder based organisations. So, you know, we started the conversation about moving away from shareholder based organisations to stakeholder based. We're now moving even further towards how organisations need to examine how it actually fits into uh, to its communities, how what values it brings not only to shareholders and the people inside the organisation, but also those outside of the organisation too. And of course, examining displacement of labour, as I mentioned, due to automation and other uh, technological advances. All of these things were part of the conversation prior to the, uh, the, when the, the pandemic first hit but it has been accelerated now that we're actually seeing a massive shift in the way that we view work, we view how organisations should be run, how leadership should be enacted. Um, and so we start to think about, can the remnants of command and control leadership, which we were starting to leave behind, and whilst it should have been left behind in the you know, mid last century, we were still seeing it in terms of our bureaucracies. Things such as right-wing agendas, grinding bureaucracies, can we see that they can make way for a collaborative structure that flex with technology and human engagement for reform notions of productivity, inclusion, sustainability and innovation? How can all of these things, now that we've seen the quickening, as McKinsey put it, now that we've seen what we could actually do in the space of a very short period of time with a different focus, how then do we actually lift the good bits out of that and take it forward into a better norm? And indeed, there's lots being written on those particular questions at, at the moment. So there's plenty of material to, to access on. So in terms of looking at this in review, um, what we're really looking at here is reforming how our organisations and our institutions work. And it, of course, is key to generating positive outcomes from a period of enormous social and economic and health crisis. Leaders, of course, have a central role to play in reimagining the impact and the nature of reform. And this includes revising the skills and capabilities required of managers and leaders. People in L&D, organisational development, have a key role to play here in developing up revised capabilities. We already know much about the value of inclusion. We've been talking about it for decades, but we've not really seen any major traction over the last 10 or so years. We know much about the value of collaboration, but until recently, we've, we've really not seen it gaining traction, particularly in terms of um, emergent leadership capability, such as distributive modes of, of capability, more human-centered leadership paradigms. And of course, looking at social cohesion and more humane work practices. We now know that flexible work practices can be very, very um, uh, effective when we actually put our minds to it. And indeed, you know, we've seen in, in some cases where we've had very little choice if we were to keep our businesses and our other organisations going. We've known about all of this stuff for decades, but we've been reticent to realise the transformational capacities associated with them been a bit too hard, perhaps a bit too expensive. And indeed, now, as I've mentioned at the, the, the top of the, uh, the presentation, you know, some form of cataclysmic change has had to come in to perhaps highlight how we could actually make these shifts. 
revised HRM, HRD practices, better leadership capabilities, better bureaucracies, of course, will be key to implementing what leaders have known to be good, better, or indeed best practice, but perhaps have failed to put into place in previous notions of business as usual context. There's a whole raft of material, as I said, is, is being written now about how traditional practices should or could be challenged and how emerging notions can be truly embedded into a reformed new business as usual, or indeed a better business as usual. If we can do that, our organisations might emerge from pandemic in better shape to rebuild, to refresh, to reprise a notion of, of work and engagement with organisations that's something that actually is of value to, to more people because it is more human-centred. If I can leave you with one idea, one concept, a quote, um, if you think of nothing else uh, from, from today's session, please take this away with you that doing things differently may not be as effective as doing different things or as vital as taking note of different voices. These are the key concepts of how leaders should be moving towards an, a better business as usual. And it's not about the nuts and bolts of business, but much more about the bigger uh, things, bigger items on our agenda, such as making work more human, making it more flexible and, and truly inclusive, um, and being able to identify organisations, whether they be public, private or third sector, in a community rather be, than being you know, as a service to it or, or indeed deriving value from it. I'd be really pleased to uh, talk about any of the questions that you might have. Um, so. Daniel, have you um, got any questions that we can talk about from here? Hello, uh, thank you so much uh, for that, Terry. Right. Uh, we definitely do have questions. Uh, let me just go ahead and switch the screens back over. Sure. Um, thank you everyone for staying with us. Um, I'm just gonna bring up the questions now. And just a quick one. So bear me one second, guys. Got a few questions that came in. Excellent. Um, so we have one that came in from Danny. This was the initial question that came over. Um, yes, the recordings will be uh, with us, Danny. I'm just about to get your question answered, actually, so stay with us for one second. Um, can we read, or where can we read uh, Mackenzie's analysis? Uh, how about I, I send uh, how about I send the link to Daniel and um, yeah. perhaps you might be able to send it out or, or put it into the to the chat. Would that sounds, be all right? Sounds like a brilliant plan. Cool. Sounds like a brilliant plan. All right, perfect. So um, that will be going out along with the recording and the slides post webinar. So everyone will get that. Oh, thank you. I'm so smart. Uh, apparently, uh, said Danny. Uh, thanks, <laughs> <laughs> um, Brian. Uh, Brian asked a question. Uh, this is a question about kind of current topics, current things. Uh, what is Terry's take on uh, Dominic Cummings? Uh, are you aware of Dominic Cummings? I am aware of Dominic Cummings. <laughs> about, about, about that laugh, yeah. Um, and the impact of his actions on the ability of Number Ten uh, to manage the situation and show leadership. Yeah. Um, well, I think it comes back to that point about um, values, mission, and vision. Really, those anchors around which the government was uh, trying to keep people together was was really. If we take the politics out of it and just look at it as a guy who was working for an organisation that was trying to put out a very serious message, that was trying to carry on a. Um, a narrative that suggests we're all in it together and that everybody has to have each other's back by doing the right thing. Regardless of your politics, what he did, the optics of the thing were absolutely catastrophic to that message. Um, I, I think there was so much damage done by that individual. Um, and the initial event took place and we saw it coming out in the media and, and then he was talking uh, about the, uh, the reasons underpinning that. It, it, it really just showed uh, how 
you know, people view these sorts of things differently and how deviance from a, a you know a, a very clearly articulated message which was based on on a set of values can be you know dispelled very easily with with rogue behavior um personally if, if if we take dominic cummings just out of the, the the mix for the minute because it's politically charged if we identify that there was an individual who was highly visible and thought to be a key decision maker in an organization who was uh, you know flouting the rules or indeed being perceived to flout rules that were applied to everybody then that person should be quite decisively um, and and um, visibly uh, managed to identify that 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 those ways of behaving were were contrary to what the organization whether it be government whether it be a charity whether it be a, you know, a FTSE 500 um, commercial business it, it just doesn't fit it, it, and and yeah I, I'm, you can probably tell from <laughs> you know I was absolutely I was stunned by not only what that individual did but how it was managed um it, it was com it's completely contrary to what i believe to be good leadership um yeah I, and i was actually going to use dominic cummings as a bit of a, a of an example in the presentation and decided not to because it was a bit politically charged <laughs> so well, thanks thanks well, thanks, thanks for the mix question. anyway yeah but but yeah. again if, if if you look at it you know in in you know with an apolitical view uh you know, a person with decision making really needs to be seen to be uh, on board with the decisions that they've made, and that—that that, I mean, at the end of the day, that's the—that's the fundamental premise. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Terry, for that. Um, Samia asks us a question: As a coach, what three topics might be the highest priorities that leaders will want to discuss, in your opinion? Yeah, I think, firstly. The, the shift from perhaps a traditional managerial paradigm where they need to know all the answers, so they need to be in control, they need to make decisions quickly um, and put it out perhaps because they are the individual that is looked to for uh, the answers. I think coaching people to understand that particularly in times like these and going forward, collaboration and listening to other voices is going to be much more important. I mean, it's always been important, but I think it's going to be more visibly important going forward. So getting getting people who perhaps have, have fallen into a habit or have got a long history of being or feeling like they are the ones to make the decisions, letting go of some of that and saying it's all right to be more collaborative, it's all right to say I don't know what's going on here, we need to to you know, bring some other people in. I think coaching people to get away from that 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 hero leadership approach would be first on my list. Second, I think it would be how to manage a truly inclusive organization, not just the, tick, you know, the box ticking of diversity that we've seen for, for some time. A truly inclusive organization will look not only to its recruitment selection and its um, succession planning of talent management, for example, it will also look to how work is done, how structures inadvertently lock certain groups out of, of organizations. It's not enough just to say we're going to hire more women or people from a BAME background or from, you know, who are um, differently able to, might have neurodiversity. Um, um, you know, they, they may well, for example, uh, be on the autism spectrum. It's not enough to say we're just gonna hire those people. The systems, the processes, the way, the very ways work is conducted needs to be reviewed. So I would be coaching leaders to be looking truly in a very granular fashion of those and thirdly i think you know coming back to this idea of humanity that um work is not just uh, you know a, a, the, the way that people derive income it is is also how they derive connection to a community it's also how they bring value to not only their organization but to their family and to themselves so i think you know being a more, more humane organization is another thing so they're, they're my top three getting away from hero leadership uh, understanding what true inclusivity looks like and being more human. Um, Terry, I've just sent over a couple of questions that were quite lengthy. You might need to read them over to digest them. Uh, sure. So if you can just read those for a second, that would be great. I'm uh, just going to read off a couple of comments that came through. Uh, thanks, um, Danny, again, uh, for the kind words and have a great time over there in Brussels. 
uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, Sammy, I'll thank you again as well. Uh, Justin, sorry about the connection. I hope you're all back online. Um, and uh, yes, Terry, you ready to? You ready? Yeah, so there's a couple here. One, uh, I mean, there's the, the quite a, a couple of here in regards to diversity and inclusion. So, um, suggest the priorities to the initial team to equip and maximize talent diversity, release, uh, especially from neurodiverse. And again, it comes back to that point about not just bringing people into the organization, but also, you know, if, you, if you've got people who are who are differently abled, they may need different ways of, of being managed. So your know, usual bureau bureaucratic structures tend not to flex enough to allow those people to bring their best selves to work. Um, and whilst we sort of talk about that in, in sort of fairly airy fairy terms, that means not just enabling them to, you know, individuals to, to uh, bring their skills and their capabilities to the organisation, but how then do they advance them for themselves as well as, um, uh, you know, the, the broader team. Um, Multi-generational labour is a key approach to unlocking potential. Um, I, I have always been averse to this idea that different generations in the workplace should be treated differently. Ever since this conversation started going right back, well, in earnest, uh, probably the mid 90s, I have always been staunchly against this idea of cutting people up into generations. We talk about Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, baby boomers, veterans, and we seem to be quite comfortable in saying, well, Gen X are like this, millennials are like this, you know, Generation Y are like that. And yet it's the same people saying, if we were talking about, well, all women are like this, uh, or um, you know, people from, I don't know, Australia are like this. Uh, you know, we would be horrified if we were talk, putting people into boxes like that, whether it be religion or, or gender or or whatever point of, of difference uh, an individual might bring to the table. And yet we're quite happy to talk about it in generational terms. So this idea that we're going back to a multi-generational you know, suite of inclusions is sort of a, I'm saying, well, we should never have split it up in the first place. Mm. Um, we know from, there's a whole raft of research that identifies that, that people fundamentally want to be respected in the workplace, they want to have their um, efforts recognised, they want to bring value and, and out of that derive some satisfaction as well of, as course of, as you know, the more fundamental economic means of, of it being you know, uh, something that allows them to, to um, live as they would like to live. So whilst, whilst I, I'm mentioning that we, we should get away from this you know, splitting up it, you know, people into generations. If we are truly managing our our, our, our people in our organisations as people, we would we will look to what motivates them, what keeps them connected to, to their to their business and to, to their peers and to their their supervisors. We will be looking to what really underpins what they see as reward, and that should not be connected to generation. It could should be connected to the individual. Um, and I've sort of gone off on a bit of a Tony's oh, already said. Don't one. Tony has already said great answer. So. Oh, excellent! Yeah, I get, I get, I get it. I, I, I've, I've always been dead against this whole argument ever since the 1990s. Um, and I, I used to get really, really, well, as you could probably tell, I used to get really ranty because there were people, particularly in Australia, selling, selling, uh, uh, consulting responses to intergenerational conflict, which actually didn't need to be resolved because if you could treat people like humans as individuals, then that whole need for, for a, a resolution or a consulting project actually goes away. Um, so that's that's my cynical approach <laughs> yeah. to, to that, yeah. Okay, if there's any more questions, guys, please do get them in. I've got a couple more to go through. Um, sure. So here we have a question. Um, has the crisis exposed a lack of investment in experiential training and emotional intelligent processes? Yeah, I, I think it has. Amongst a whole raft of other things, I think fundamentally it's exposed a lack of investment of organisations to develop their people generally. Um, and, and indeed, as I mentioned, the, the idea that um, resilience comes from people, not from processes. Um, yeah, in, in times of normal operation, processes can be really very useful. It, it allows people to be very clear about what they should be doing, what's acceptable and what's not. But when those, those, that context is actually thrown into disarray, as we've seen, it yeah. relies on people to actually make decisions 
for themselves. Um, that that they and and of course a lot of that comes back to being able to read the situation, to be able to work with other people, and that is basically is, uh, the question I suggested based on emotional intelligence and being able to um, understand context and the responses of other people in that context. And indeed, for leaders, um, and I come back to that point about um, you know, a, a collaborative, more distributed. Uh, way of leading, we have to, um, you know, temper that with the, the idea that you're dealing with people, and and as such, you need to have a suite of skills and capabilities that enables you to to make sense. Come back to that, that sense making term to make sense of what's going on with the people around them. So yes, I do. I think generally it's thrown up a, a lack of investment in people, uh, at, you know, at the you know, for to, to, to bolster other things such as profitability, efficiency, and perhaps a, a whole raft of other um, key metrics, but it has left us with a gaping hole of of, of uh, you know, people being able to be resilient as a group of people inside an organisation rather than relying on bureaucracy. So yes, I do agree with that. Fantastic, and we've just got one last question uh, that's come through. Um, it's it's a hard one for me to decipher, but hopefully you can make some sense of it. So it is yeah. um, the need for looking at people um, in a more hu human sense and how it relates to their spirit and respecting their spirituality. Um, yep. Can you just talk on that a little bit? Yeah, well, I think spirituality is has been on the agenda for some time. It's one of those things that I would I would package up with the the things that were being talked about but perhaps were being danced around rather than actually really being picked up um well, some colleagues of mine in australia found a business you know going back you know, 20 or 30 years based on bringing spirituality back into or, or recognizing spirituality in the workplace and we're not talking about religion we're talking about how how people are connected to bigger things um and so organizations uh, i think for you know, particularly for, for the most part of last century we're sort of managing that out so sort of check your head at the door bring your labor in do what i say i will pay you for this money um just do what you know, we want you to do and go away again mm. and and uh, you know if we think about you know um you know early last century you know, people really were just sort of factors of production and it didn't really change that much really until about the mid last century. But then we, we saw the humanness being managed out again during the, the 80s and the latter part of the last century. And we're seeing it, you know, the reprise of that, that now, that spirituality has been pretty much purged from most of our organisations. It's something that, that, that people connect to religion and, and perhaps are a little bit uh, reticent to, to go near because it can be you know, quite a charged topic. But spirituality is, is a different thing. It is, a, is about you know, what people are actually getting out of being in an organisation, how it connects to their, their broader communities, how it connects to their other passions. Um, and I think you know, this schism has really given us an opportunity to start rethinking some of those things. And I do think that that, that, that human element that I mentioned for the, uh, the coaching questions, spirituality is part and parcel of that. You can't separate humans from from spirit and as i said it's not about religion it's about something else and you know, that might mean be different things to different people but we need to take that on board we need to bring in back this notion that we're bringing the whole of person into the workplace um, and not asking them to to check their baggage at the door at the door yeah definitely i know i said that was the last one so diane's actually made me out to be a lad there's one more question that's just come in this is the, sure. the last last one uh for you terry so leaders effectiveness is only as good as trust they engender um would you agree uh i take that as meaning that that leaders are only as good as the amount of trust that they can garner yeah. from the individuals around them absolutely yeah. if 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 a leader doesn't have trust they're the anything they do around values mission and missions is going to be undermined anything they do around resilience and asking people to step up is going to be undermined if you're yeah. asking people to go into the unknown because they don't know what their organisations, what their livelihoods are going to look like in in you know, the, the foreseeable future, then that's going to be undermined. I don't, I don't, you know, if if there's if there's you know a, one of those things that, that I've sort of mentioned throughout the the um the course of the the slides, 
the underpinning premise is that leaders have to engender trust. And once you lose that trust, it's very difficult, A, to regain it, of course, on a human level, but it's also very difficult to make a case for anything going forward. Yeah. Um, and indeed, as I mentioned, you know, where you know, organisations that have been um, suffering from talent shortages, if you know, opportunities open up elsewhere, now that there's a whole raft of movement going on, some people are going to find themselves unemployed, some people are going to have the opportunity to go into other organisations. It's those organisations whose leaders have diminished or squandered the opportunity for trust. It's those organisations that are likely going to see people moving to other organisations where those opportunities arise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that. So you filled the questions brilliantly. Um, thank you again, guys, for joining us. Everyone that's joined us, um, thank you again, Joe, for the nice comment. Thank you, Justin, for your kind comments, and everyone else that sent over uh, great comments over uh, of support. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Like I said, um, that will be it for today from myself and Terry. Terry, do you have any final words for? Uh, I, I thank you so much for doing all these with you. Um, I will send over that link so that you can get hold of the McKinsey work and yeah. have a lovely weekend when we get to it. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Caroline, Andre, um, and everyone else on the call, Brian, everyone else. Thank you guys so much for joining us, Verna, Katie. Uh, just want to uh, say one last thing. So we're going to have the slides coming through to you guys, the video, and also that link um, as well with that information requested. Uh, so, yeah, look out for that email. should be with you all next week. And we will be sending out uh, information on our next webinar in that email as well. So please do have a look out for that. And when you do actually get through to the um, to the YouTube channel, if you can, just subscribe there for us. That would be much appreciated. And then you'll be able to get the feed of all of our, of our webinars then on demand uh, for you. So thank you all again uh, for joining us today. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you again next week Thursday. Thank you so much.